Katie Jakes recently has been in a lot of controversy, but for this time, we're going to address his Christological heresies. He traveled because he gave up his omnipresence. Because as father, he never had to travel. He's just there. Let's talk about it here on All Things Theology. Cue my theme music. All Things Theology, All Things Theology, we chop it up properly without an apology. Gotta get that theology to God, hollow because this is how we do it at All Things Theology. Yo, grace and peace, and welcome back to an episode of All Things Theology, where this is your host, K Dub, and today we are going to talk about TD Jakes and not for uh, recent speculations and controversies that he may be in as far as uh, cultural stuff. <laughs> We're not going to get in that. We'll leave that to other people who have been investigating and sp maybe even speculating to some sense about those issues. No, we're going to get into T.D. Jake's Christology. What is T.D. Jake's view of the Godhead? I remember some time ago, we we're actually going to play this clip before we get into yesterday's or a few days ago sermon uh, about his view of God. I remember uh, quite some time ago, man, it had to be over a decade ago now, um, when he uh, got pressed on the issue of the nature of Godhead, when he sat down at the elephant room. Some of you may remember that. Matter of fact, we're going, what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to play that clip so you can kind of get a little context of what we're going to get into. So let's check it out. You, you know, the issue between Trinitarianism and modalism at its essence is one God. And let me just say, this is a very interesting clip because we have the who's who of people who've disqualified their ministry now with the likes of uh, Mark Driscoll and James Donald and other men. But that's beside the point. We're going to get we're going to focus on T.D. Jakes manifesting himself successively in three ways or one God, three persons um, simultaneously eternally, existing eternally. eternally. So so uh, Mark Driscoll is kind of asking him, um, what, what do you believe about God? Is it is it uh, three persons, uh, one being or is it? one being manifesting himself in three different ways. Now, there is a difference if you're actually familiar with uh, Trinity versus uh, modalism. But even prior to this, T.D. Jakes was kind of, you know, listening to him is very confusing. So I think that's why this sermon we're going to listen to in a second is actually going to shed some light on what he actually believes. But the sermon, the in this elephant room, he was kind of saying, you know, I, I see Trinity and oneness, which I mean, if that's what you truly did see, and if I was like legitimate, that would be a contradiction. And obviously, you know, Bible believing Christians, we don't believe there are any contradictions in the Bible. So the fact that he kind of says, well, I see both really to me sheds light that at this point in time, he's trying to be um, weaselly, a little bit weaselly and stuff like that. So you can go listen to that. I didn't put that here, but let's continue on. Your best understanding now, and I understand there is some mystery for sure. Would you say it's one God? manifesting himself in three ways or one God in three persons. But I, I believe that, that neither one of them totally get it for me, but I think the latter one is, is where I stand today. But he, even in this, so he kind of, you know, uh, I guess capitulates to a tr more Trinitarian, but he was like, you know, none of them really do it for me, you know, uh, which is very interesting to say. One yeah, God, three persons? No, one God, three persons. One God, three persons. And, and here, here is why I am there. I don't, I'm not crazy about the word persons. And this is, most people who know me know that that is really, my doctrinal statement is no different from yours except for the, the, the injection word of manifestation. The manifest, inst, manifest instead of persons, which you describe as modalist and I describe as Pauline. When, when I read, let me show you what I'm saying. When I read. I'm going to wait to, uh, comment on that here in a second because uh but i'll just let him play i'll let, i'll play it here and let you see for yourself when i read first timothy three sixteen, i didn't i didn't create this modalist in and without controversy which i think we have we have bickered about something that is what paul describes a mystery and i don't think we should do that and without controversy and let me i do want to respond to that because when paul uses the term mystery he doesn't mean unknown 
you know, a lot of uh, people have a more pagan understanding of, of the term mystery. The term mystery actually is something that was hidden that has now been revealed. You know, the, go go look at all the terms mystery has been used with that definition in mind. And it, and it actually uh, may, may shed a lot of clarity because uh, they all because they end up telling you what the mystery is. So it's like it wouldn't make sense to tell you what the mystery is if they're saying, well, this mystery is unknown. Uh, you know, just think about that. Great is the mystery of godliness for God was manifest in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul is not a modalist, but he does not think that it is robbery to the divinity of God to say God was manifest in the flesh. Right. So I do want to address this because the, you know, modalists will, you know, they use the term manifestation and that, that, you know, that's, that's not a bad term in and of itself, but they've uh, modalists have hijacked that biblical term to you to really to demonstrate that it is the father manifesting, revealing himself three different ways. So what you have is it's the father kind of putting shape shifting in some sense, you know, it's the father. One, you know, one day he's the father in, in, in this dispensation and then in the uh, incarnation, the father is really the son. And the the uh, you know if you talk to modalists, the name of the Father is Jesus. So what you have in the incarnation is not the true Son Himself, distinct from the Father, distinct from the Spirit. It is actually the Father Himself. So you guys got to understand that that is the because he says you know our our doctrinal statement really isn't the same. It, it's really the same besides the term uh, manifestation. Well, there's a lot of doctrine packed in that term uh, manifestation from a modalist perspective or even T.D. Jake's perspective, which we're going to get to in a second. And I think if it, maybe the semantics could be this way or that way. But Paul says this before this fight ever started. He, but he also goes, oh, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Mm -hmm. Now, now when, when we start talking about that sort of thing, uh, I, I, I think that it is important that we realize that there are distinctives between the Father and the working of the Son. Father didn't bleed, Father didn't die, uh, only in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, coming back for us in the person. Now, you know, depending on the modalist, they they will sound like they're saying the same thing. And he's, he's about to get a fist bump from all these guys, right? Like, oh, T.D. Jakes is Trinitarian. But they'll say, yeah, it wasn't the father who bled because, remember, it's the son who the father kind of, uh, you know, it, 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 it is the father in his uh, essence, but not in his role, they would say, you know. So, uh, so when he says, hey, it wasn't the father who bled and died, well, He's saying, well, it was the son, the father being manifested as the son. So, again, um, a lot of this, you know, the elephant room, I, when, I remember listening to it and it was still kind of like, man, there's some kind of ways out of here, you know, because watch what he says here in a second. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has been with us but only indwells us through the person of the Holy Spirit. We are baptized into the body of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't think any of that is objectionable between any of the three of us so far. Not at all. So, so that is consistent with my belief system. Here, now, I would ask uh, T.D. Jake some more pressing questions if I was on the elephant room. Uh, I'm no one, but you know what I'm saying. Is the Son eternally existent with the Father and the Spirit? See, that that would actually shed more light on if if T.D. Jakes was truly Trinitarian. Is the Son in himself divine Yahweh distinct from the Father? You know, because he said, I'm not crazy about persons. Because, yeah, I think that gets to the to the issue of what he doesn't want to, uh, you know, uh, concede to. You know, so those are some pressing questions I would want to ask if I was on this panel. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. So he gets I'm a fist you. bump. I have been with you. I teach, preach that all the time. There are many people within and outside of quote unquote denominations that are labeled oneness that would describe that the same way. There are some that would not. And so, yeah, that was what, again, I wanted to give a little context to why I think T.D. Jakes have gotten a pass by many uh, people that, you know, say, hey, he's Trinitarian, even though he still has the prosperity gospel issue. That's a problem. Right. And so I, I think he has gotten a pass because of uh, the elephant room where he, um, I, you know, this is my perspective. Obviously, he weaseled his way out of that conversation. Right. You know, and Mark Driscoll gave him a fist bump. James McDonald, they're grinning and glowing like, yeah, we got him. He's Trinitarian. Uh, but he was just kind of like, I'm just not comfortable with Trinitarian. If you go listen to that, there, it, it really wasn't an admission to the Trinity. It was just kind of trying to get as close to the language as possible. But nevertheless, what we're going to do right now is we're going to get into this recent sermon uh, that was Christmas Eve, where he kind of got into some of these issues as well. So let's talk about it. 
the creator has now become subject to what he created. He gave up his omnipotence, his omniscience, and his omnipresence. So he's about to elaborate on this more, but um, T.D. Jake states that Jesus, he gave up, essentially he's saying he gave up divine attributes. He stopped becoming what he once was. Um, I'm going to fundamentally disagree with that and deny that. Uh, text like Philippians 2, which we'll get to in a second. I'll, I'll let him elaborate some more. But if Jesus gave up his divine essence, some divine qualities, then he ceased being God. So, but that's clearly not what's uh, suggested or communicated even in the, uh, in the uh, gospels, nor in, nor in uh, the epistles, texts like Colossians 2, right? 2, 9, for in him dwells all the fullness of deity in bodily form. So whatever you try to do with Jesus and the, uh, you know, these kind of issues, you know, uh, fully God, fully man, what we can't deny is that Jesus is God. In human form, in bodily form, as the Apostle Paul says in Colossians 2. So he's got to go on and, and kind of elaborate on these issues. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll respond further in a second. But let's, let's hear, him, hear him out on this. He submitted himself to prayer because he'd given up omnipotence, all powerful. Now he has to go to the garden and pray. So he's saying, hey, he stopped being all powerful. So Jesus was actually not all powerful. And one of the issues was because he prayed, um, which I would argue is not a sign of uh, you um, not being all powerful. It's actually a sign of humility, uh, worship, uh, things like that. Uh, no, Jesus, you know, what was one of the things he said when, you know, they came down to uh, capture him? Hey, uh, hey, if I wanted to, I could send down a legion of angels right now. Uh, Jesus was all powerful to to uh, do the miracles he did, exhibit it. His his power so much that the you know the disciples were what manner of man is this right Jesus did not cease being omnipotent again we're going to get into some of this issue I think Philippians two uh, rightly and correctly addresses a lot of these issues if you're, you're kind of stumbling through all these things omniscience because he says no man knoweth the day nor the hour which the son of man cometh no not the angels nor the son. But the Father, which is in heaven, I mean, let, let me just say this to the issue of omniscience and, and, and this overarching deal of uh, Jesus kind of what he's arguing kind of is this kenosis theory, right? This kenosis theory is kind of he gave up some of these divine attributes and people wrongly uh, use Philippians, too. But let's quote the author of Hebrews who, who addresses, I believe, the nature of Christ by stating uh, that Jesus, he changes not right. He is t the same today. Right. <laughs> Yesterday and forevermore. Jesus actually does not change. He possesses immutability. So if Jesus gave up something, a divine essence, a divine character attributes, he would no longer be immutable. He would he would he would be wouldn't be God. Right. And God does not give up his godness to say it bluntly and plainly. But we'll let him continue. I don't know everything anymore. So I gave up my omniscience. He traveled because he gave up his omnipresence. Because as father, he never had to travel. Did you hear that? I, I want to go back because maybe that was a Freudian slip by T.D. Jakes. But notice who he calls Jesus. He traveled because he gave up his omnipresence. Because as father, he never had to travel. He's just there. But Jesus had to get on a boat and travel to come. Where so you clearly, T.D. Jakes calls Jesus the father. Right. This, this, this is exactly what I've been saying long ago, that I have not been convinced that T.D. Jakes is a Trinitarian. Uh, he's made statements in the past that have sounded modalistic. And it is clearly a modalistic statement uh, calling Jesus the father. Uh, I, I do want to do something. One, I'm going to uh, quote Philippians 2. I want to get into that. And then I want to give a, a quote that really breaks down Philippians 2. I think will be helpful. In Philippians 2, you have uh, the Apostle Paul really encouraging the saint of God to exhibit humility, humility to one another in verses 1 through 5. 
Um, matter of fact, I'll start at verse five, but that is the context of this chapter. Humility. We should exhibit humility. But Paul grounds uh, us being humble in the fact that Christ, though he was God, was humble. Right. If Christ, who is God, who came in the flesh, can be humble, so should you. Right. He says that to have this mind among yourselves, starting at verse five, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Right. We have the mind of Christ who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. This is actually a great uh, a great uh, revelation we have, illumination even that we have is that Jesus, though he was God, equal with God, did not count it. Did not count equality with God in the flesh, uh, right? But but rather, see, and it's not humility if you're not God to say you're not God, right? You know, for those who deny the deity of Christ. Verse 7, but emptied himself. See, now a lot of people will say, see, he stopped being God, right? This emptying himself. But rather, it actually doesn't say he emptied himself of Godhood. This is an insertion people make. But, but we actually have the explanation of what it means to empty himself, but notice, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. So this emptying himself was an emptying by taking on something. We're going to I'm going to elaborate more on that in a second. Being born in the likeliness of men. So Jesus did not stop becoming God, but rather he veiled himself in by coming a man. Let me read this quote to you. I think you will be blessed by this. My pastor shared this and I, I think it will be good. Let me put it on the screen for you. I don't mind covering me right now. It says, uh, pa- by the way, go pa- go follow my pastor, uh, Landon Kozeny, and uh, send all your p- complaints about this channel to him. <laughs> your daily dose of incarnational gold. I think this is such a good quote by R.C. Sproul. If you're understanding how, hey, how is he fully fully God, fully de- uh, fully man? How do these things co- coincide with one another? Well, I think this is a good explanation. It says the incarnation was not so much a subtraction. As it was in addition, exactly what I said, the eternal second person of the Trinity took on himself a human nature and joined his divine nature to that human nature for the purpose of redemption. Right. So Jesus has two natures in one person, no mixing, nothing of that sort. Hundred percent God, hundred percent man, Uh, his divine nature. Right. So speaking of the two states, he began in exalt in exaltation in the glory of heaven. But he condescended to join us in our earthly existence in order to redeem us. Right. So God became a man to save man. But only God can save man. Right. By entering into human flesh, he underwent a profound, profound humiliation. Uh, And this doesn't mean like he was embarrassed, but rather a lowliness. That's what the, uh, you know, theological term of humiliation, a, a, a condescension. Right. Throughout his lifetime, the humiliation became deeper and darker, finally reaching its nadir, its lowest point in the cross. And to that, Charles or Charles (laughs) R.C.'s bro, I say amen. And so, man, I was was listening to that. I was listening to the sermon. Uh, I don't know why it popped up in my feed, maybe because all the controversy going on with T.D. Jakes. But I was like, hey, let me let me check this out. And I heard that statement. I was like, my goodness, he's saying he lost divine essence. Jesus, fully God, fully man, lost divine essence. Um, good thing to, you know, if you would have been pressing more, maybe at the elephant room, maybe that would have came out more so. Uh, but that's not only where it got bad in that sermon, because, you know, there have been a lot of sermons uh, about uh, about the incarnation that have really made the incarnation fundamentally about us. And so what I want to do is actually share how T.D. Jakes, he essentially made this sermon about him and all the controversy that he's getting into. But I found this one uh, the most alarming. We are one people, we stand together. And I want to pray for people because I know what it is to feel like your shoulders are too small for the government you carry. Everybody bring everything to you. So he... He, he, he had been expounding on Isaiah 9, and a lot of this uh, sermon was about the government being on our shoulders, though we're little and small, right? Kind of like the incarnation, the birth of Christ. He was trying to make parallel about this. But my friends, the government being upon his shoulder is only on his shoulder. It is never said to be on our shoulders. Uh, we don't carry the kingdom. We don't carry the government upon our shoulders. It is the uh, deity of Christ, right? And and then going on with his name being called, 
wonderful counselor, mighty God. This sermon was just gaslighting for those for for the controversies he's in. Again, I'm that's not my point to get into, but but you know there are some preachers who want who will search high and low to find themselves in the text, and so I thought this sermon I thought this sermon would be good to respond to due to the Christological blunders in it. I mean, there, there were at least three Christological heresies or theological proper heresies that were in this uh, sermon or in, in that one minute clip. And so hopefully this actually helped you in understanding the two natures of Christ. Um, you know, man, uh, a good book to get to, you want to understand some Christological heresies that have existed throughout history is actually a book called Heresies. Of, you know, I think it's called Heresy of the Early Church and it's by uh, Harold Brown. I have it on my shelf here somewhere. Uh, it's right down there. Uh, it's the hold on, like right here. It's the purple book here. It's called Heresies by Harold Brown. It will be a good uh, book so you can kind of understand uh, some of the heresies that have existed throughout church history. So that when you hear people like T.D. Jake saying they're not really saying anything new, these are old ancient heresies that have been uh, you know, argued for and defended in the past. And so hopefully that will be helpful. Hopefully that resource will be good if you want to check that out to the next time, y'all. Grace and peace. Yo, grace and peace. Thank you for watching another episode of All Things Theology. If you enjoyed what you heard today, go on and give me a like, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell. I promise to give you weekly lives, videos, interactions, exposing false teachers, sharing with you, the viewer, my theological beliefs, things about the culture and the Bible. So if you're here for that, come on and join us. Also, if you would like to support this channel financially, you can do so by becoming a Patreon member or a YouTube member. Links are in the description below. You can see content before it drops. You can also have Q&A sessions with also other Patreon members, YouTube members as well. So if you like that, hit the description link in below. Yeah.